everyone good morning it's me richard listens and i'm here for another edition of the richard listens podcast and i'm doing mine today in front of this fabulous artwork by artist david sumik uh this one is called hamakom and it means the place and so for all of you watching and for all of you listening, we all know we've been sheltered in place for a few months here. So I thought it was appropriate um, to bring a little art and the things that are inside that people are using to motivate them to keep sane focused and direct their energies as we extend uh, into um, already in our third month here in Los Angeles. So wherever you are, I hope you're safe if you're out of quarantine uh, and uh, hope it's gonna be a good uh, Memorial Day weekend for everyone uh, with some fun time outside that's done in a respectful manner. And it's uh, it was great last weekend to see the hiking trails be outside again, but uh, you know, wearing masks and things like that, certainly the new normal takes a lot for people to process even on the days that are your relaxation days and downtime. So uh, I know it's an issue for all of you because I'm hearing about it throughout the week. So it's okay. Keep pushing yourself to figure out what's right for you and what's the healthiest way to live your life and live in balance with respect and dignity for others. Uh, today is an exciting day. I have a dating expert, one who's been featured on Good Morning America. Dr. Phil has called her the best of the best. She's been on MSNBC, the Hallmark Channel, and she even was a host for VHS, VH1's, VHS, I'm dating myself, VH1's Making Mr. Right. She's responsible for countless lasting relationships and marriages, and she is the CEO of Level Connections. April Bayer is my guest today. Uh, we're going to be talking about as many topics as we can include, which uh, are dating and relating during the pandemic. I know for all of you who are single out there, this is still a key issue for all of you. How do you continue in the world of online dating and the do's and don'ts in general of meeting your soulmate? The future of dating will be talked about uh, and how the single community has already shifted. And we will try and get to topics such as dating apps, the common mistakes women make when they're looking for the one, uh, chemistry, approachability, and value-based dating. I'm excited today to bring you this quality can content. I thank you for joining my tribe, signing up on my email distribution list, going to patreon.com slash Richard Listens. If you haven't done so already, pause the recording go and do so. We cannot continue to provide and survive without your support. Even a dollar, three dollars a month makes a big difference. And as a member, you get advanced content. Thank you again uh, to all my Instagram supporters and followers who've been joining us on live Q&As and videos. We will continue to bring you experts from multiple realms in psychology, fitness, and health, uh, as well as coping with trauma and stress and anything that you need at this time, bring it to me and I will try and bring my tribe and network to you. That's my gift to you. Um, and the gift that's been given to me through all my years is amazing connections and support. And I want you to have the same access that I've had. So um, without further ado, before we hop into that, thanks to our sponsors, Injitsu and Impact Dental Designs. If you have not tried an Injitsu workout, please go to their website and sign up and you too can do a 30 minute live workout with an MMA fighter and spend the last 30 minutes with a Q&A. So it's okay for you to get a sweat and you can even bring the kids along if they're at home and in Zoom school. Without further ado, thank you all for listening. Thank you for being present with me and supporting my show. Uh, we will bring you live with April. Yeah. All right. So after we've got down touting her concerns, welcome to the show, April Bear. Thank you so much. Thank you, Richard. <laughs> Thank you for making time. And uh, you know, I, I you know I think I was a junior matchmaker when I was younger. So I wonder, you know, if I had this skill set as well. I mean, can people be groomed into becoming matchmakers and dating experts? Uh, or, you know, it, it, was this an acquired skill set for you? 
I don't, it wasn't an acquired skill set. I probably was like you. I was matching, you know, my dolls when I was five. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not giving up that much information yet, although I did play um, with uh, Playmobil and uh, Star Wars. <laughs> you know, it's it's not a it's not a learned skill set. I think people in most fields, if you start with, you know, what are the attributes or the traits that make you good at what you do then you can be groomed into something. Clearly, you know, growing up, I didn't think I was gonna become, you know, a matchmaker and a dating coach. It's not like you, you envision this, right? There's no school for it. Um, but I was always extremely curious. And so that, that insatiable curiosity that got me in trouble in school, uh, my constant why, why do we need that? Why is this got me into this field? Um, so I've been at it for two decades. And really to me, it's the love of people, the love of connection, and that insatiable curiosity that um, allows me to find the best matches for people. That's, that's, that's beautiful. beautiful. And, uh, you know, I, you, when you read your message and you read like, you know, the, the, the whole premise behind level connections uh, being about care, authenticity, uh, do you find that, that when most clients approach you that, um, they need a course in this? I mean, is it almost like a lot of unlearning going on where you can actually, how do you teach people where there's so much defensiveness and jadedness in the world right now to find that place within themselves and trust it? Well, when I started my own company in 2003, and even before that, when I was running someone else's uh, firm, it was clear to me that people needed a good 90 days of preparation um, and of course, we would refer to wonderful therapists because it's hard. You know, it's it's not an easy task when somebody comes to you with decades of, you know, a, a blind spot or, you know, certain behaviors and patterns or limiting beliefs, and then they say, "Here's my here's my dream partner. Please go find it." Um, most of the work in my office is undoing a lot of behavior and making sure that they have some clarity of who they are, a realistic view, and what their value is in a relationship and their needs versus their wants. There's so much more than just setting up dates. Um, so I would say that's most of my work and also the pleasure of my work. It's what I love the most is helping people develop these relationship skills. And, and is there, I mean, it sounds like any other type of work. There's a lot of pre-work. There's a lot of personal work before you even like think to click on or send a request for a date, um, you know? And so do you find most people are willing to do that work or is there a resistance of just, you know, trial and error? I'll just get there. If you just keep sending me on matches and, and I'll get. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I've been a personal matchmaker to some of the most successful men in the world for 20 years. And then uh, a few years ago, I developed Level to make matchmaking more affordable and accessible. But, you know, when you're dealing with men, especially, and, it's, and I had a male-driven business model, who are high achievers and used to being the leaders, and everybody's coming to them for advice and support, it is a humbling experience to come to someone like me and say, okay, uncle, clearly April, I'm doing something wrong because uh, I'm not getting my dreams. I'm not you know, meeting my goals. What can I do? Um, that's a special kind of human, um, especially for high achieving men and women. Um, I would say 60% of my clients over the years have wanted the advice and counsel. Uh, my phone is off like off the hook. I get calls from dates. I get calls from Europe when somebody's about to propose. What do I do? What do I do? How do I say this? We just had a fight. Help me, April. Um, those clients, if I look back at all the marriages I put together, pretty much, mo like I would say 95% of the marriages that I've helped create, those men and women that they were dating were really uh, open to learning and growing throughout the process with me. So after we had their first date, there was the post-date phone call and then second date, another post-date phone call. And those are the ones I've been the most successful with. The ones who say, all I need is your database are the ones that we technically usually don't succeed with because there's, there's what you think, but then there's also, what is this other person saying? And what we found just with seeing the feedback of 20 years, and I'm still in that, even though I have a data-driven and tech supported company, I'm still in it every day. What most people think happened on a first date that was sort of the, de you know, the derailing of that date isn't actually what happened or what that person thought. So for me, feedback is king. You know, why wouldn't you want to know what the other person thought or said, right? It's just data. 
So I think if people want to come into this, they should come in with, I always say, open heart, open mind, um, and, uh, and a thick skin, because you're going to hear some stuff you may not want to hear as far as, you know, how you were perceived on that date. And it's, it is humbling, but also exciting. <laughs> Feedback <laughs> is never easy. <laughs> well, like, how do you feel about that? You know, I always say, you know, somebody asked me yesterday in a class I'm teaching, what is the difference between feedback and criticism? And that was such an interesting uh, perspective because I feel like a lot of people who've had criticism their whole lives, it's like they can't swallow anything, even if it's kind feedback, they, can, they just can't handle it. Um, and those who didn't have a lot of that tend to be more open. Like, I love feedback. Feedback is the essential tool of my business. Um, you know, if you were a client, I know you're married, but if you were a client, I would be saying, like, <laughs> what are we doing right? What are we doing wrong? What do you need more of? What do you need less of? Um, but I don't know if you, uh, clearly you see that. And that was a big question yesterday. Feedback versus criticism. It's not easy. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that there's so many angles with that. And, and because so many of our listeners are men, I'm really glad we're tapping into, you know, the, you know, the need to be authentic. Um, and we're continuing on with April Byer. We had some behind the scenes a uh, few moments there. So sorry for any uh, jumps in our conversation. And we're talking about authenticity in men. A lot of my work, a lot of my clients with men working on developing trust within themselves, trust with other men ways in which um, they trust the process and yet coming to a personal trainer is going to make you do push-ups is hard enough. Um, maybe that's kind of, you know, what we call ego syntonic, you know, that's like, you know, in line with being a manly man. So how is it that you help men step into this place of vulnerability and authenticity and, and, and meet their, the challenges and resistance. I mean, what, what are some of the things you, you know, you're able to do when you're getting these texts and these, you know, from across the world, as we're speaking, people, you know, what do I do? And, and this isn't working. And, and, you know, how do you overcome that? First, I just remind the men that I'm working with that we're in this together, that we're a team. And I also say, you know, how you're interacting with me, instead of thinking of this as a business arrangement, you know, I'm not a lawyer. I'm not a doctor, I'm not a CPA. I'm your matchmaker, which means I need to be sensitive. Um, I need to be in tune with who you are. I need to be on your team. I need to be your cheerleader. So I always say how a, how a client is treating me or someone on my staff is, is indicative of how they're going to treat the women I'm introducing them to. So first and foremost, I remind everybody that I am on their team. I want what they want. Um, and I also you know, spend a lot of time learning about family, how they were brought up, their relationships, what worked, what didn't work. And I'm, I'm quick to see what they've been missing, whether it's, you know, 20 years of a marriage where they didn't have enough gratitude when they walked in the door. Um, so then I have to search for that, but also remind them of why they're here, right? And to make sure I help them avoid some of their blind spots and to keep them in the mindset of, these are women we're dealing with. And in order to um, meet them on their level, just listen more. You know, you don't have to parade your accomplishments in front of a woman. I'm speaking those for you. I'm representing you. So it's really about showing up as a man of how you would be in relationship. You don't need to um, list your CV. You know, you're not here to entertain or to make the date fun, fun and fabulous. You're there to reveal and share which I don't think a lot of men, especially high achieving men, have that kind of support network. Some do, but not often, where you know, you're know you walking down the corridor of your office and someone's saying, Bob, how are you? You know, How are you doing? Or you were amazing today, or you look, you look handsome. Like women, we get that all day long with each other. So I think the transition from work to a date is smoother for some. But then there are women who are also in high achieving positions that are not getting that. And maybe they don't have a really good network of women around them. So to go from day to night, work to a date is a huge U-turn. So I try to just love up on my clients. I get very close to them. I'm, I'm their confidant, their best friend, their, their mom, their sister. You know, it really is just reminding them of love. I know that sounds so overly simplified. Um, 
most oftentimes when somebody becomes like the bear and they go into self-preservation, it's just reminding them of, you know what, we're all human, we're all doing our best. Um, you're amazing, let's keep going. So yeah, there's this consistent, you know, letting people know that yesterday doesn't equal today in love. You could have like a bad couple of months of not really meeting anybody you like and then it just, it's like a light switch where something beautiful happens. I had a client that just proposed during COVID. Um, I helped <laughs> him find his jeweler. I helped him um, decorate the backyard when he was gonna propose because they couldn't go anywhere. You know, he was with me for six, seven months by the time I found this amazing woman. And until then, nothing was really hitting. So it, it just takes one. And I think we have to remember faith. You know, teaching faith is an interesting thing because I don't necessarily mean a religious faith. But if you have faith in yourself, faith in me, um, faith in the universe that it's going to provide, you can kind of ride through your dating life with a little bit more ease and confidence. And you don't go into fight or flight or panic mode that it's never going to happen. And that's usually when we get derailed. It's when people go into that panic of it's never going to happen. So mm. just reminding everybody, please have faith. This will happen. We are going to find her, right? But you got to find yourself before you find someone else so i'm a bigger believer in do the work and then the person will appear such a crucial message there and you said a few things so i'm going to slow you down and stop you down because a couple of things clicked the, the light bulbs in my brain first of all amazing all the people i'm hearing out there doing proposals weddings making you know uh, you know i've heard children of of uh, you know cancer survivors that are having birthday parties at home and having everyone in the community decorate their their backyards and get dressed up so it's so beautiful what people are doing during quarantine and i do want to get to a section uh on how people are navigating dating post covid because uh even though this may be a small segment in time we do know that this can impact the way people trust and feel safe and secure especially with really important things like uh you know touch uh and, and other ways that we establish connection uh, but you know, the thing you were mentioning about, uh, you know, trust and how in most relationships, whether I be in a therapy role or in a coach role, a sports psychologist, is initially, you know, we're drawn towards people who give us something. And then when our trust gets tested, we kind of like, there's always a resistance phase. There's always something, you know, it, it, you know, for me, if it's four sessions in or something like that, there's a, there's a trust issue. Somebody had to cancel late. How do you handle their personal needs? Can you, so, you know, the importance of what you're talking about of getting really close to your clients and being willing to be totally vulnerable and present to show them and, and kind of relearn some of the aspects of attachment and love. Uh, how valuable that is as a, as a as a customer service way of operating in a business when you're trying to make a, a personal change, uh, because you know we were talking a little bit offline, right? That that this we're human beings too, providing these services, but people are bringing us our mo their most vulnerable attachments, and whether they be the most successful, even oftentimes when people are the most successful, either they had the most nurturing, caring, supportive team and network that has really helped shape their village to make them who they are, or they've been doing it all on their own. And so this idea of trusting somebody or letting somebody <laughs> help them and, and, and to meet a match has got to be, as much as it seems great, it's got to be really scary. Yeah, oftentimes I'm the first person they've trusted. Um, and so I think you're right. I think it's the reminder of I'm not going anywhere right? You can become the bear and you can become scared, right? But I'm personally not going anywhere. And it's a lesson, right? It's a lesson. I'm so big on customer service. Um, I'm, I'm super particular about that. How we answer a phone, how quickly we return an email, not because it's necessarily a business policy, but it's because I can feel when people are sort of on that edge. We know that holidays impact people with how they're feeling about their memberships. We know that the weekend Friday, we do a let's touch base with clients day because we know that the weekend is usually date, you know, date weekend. And if they don't have somebody to connect with, we call it, you know, Monday cleanup on aisle nine. Mondays are the most brutal day in my office because that's when people either had no date or they had a great date or they had a bad date, um, whether it's on their own or through us. If I'm working with somebody, I am dealing with all of their personal lives. So even if they're dealing with us for their dates, that doesn't mean they're not meeting people organically or on a dating app. So I have to kind of take in all that information. And I think you're right. It is how we were raised. I trust easily, but
but it's because I was raised in a very safe, consistent environment, and I'm lucky for that. So then it's a matter of like, who do you know that is somebody who's always been there for you, that's given you that safe, you know, safe space to land. And that's what I teach women, to be honest, is that if you can create a safe space for a man to land, that's how you can really enter his heart. I was dealing with a woman the other day and she said, I never thought about that. I always thought I was supposed to be on a date and just getting to know that person to see if they were of my level. My response is no, you're there to, you're there to learn and you're there to hold space for somebody, a soft space to land, to be compassionate. And I don't think the word compassion always mixes with dates. I think we think and reserve compassion for people in need, people we've known for a long time, our friends, our family member, but what about compassion for somebody you are on a date with? And maybe like five minutes before they showed up or 10 minutes before that Zoom date or that FaceTime date, maybe they just had a crushing blow. And I think having that sensitivity. While is, you're at your most anxious and nervous yourself. Well, <laughs> right. You realize somebody else is going through something too. And that's why uh, I'm always advising, get the inner critic off your shoulder. You know, he or she is not invited to the date. <laughs> somebody else, the person you're sitting across from is having a bad day too, or they're worried if they're enough or tall enough or pretty enough or successful enough. Everybody's got their eye on their own life. And then if they shut down or they're shy or they're remote or reserved, Nobody's getting anything done. So it's, it's a very complicated, beautiful thing. Um, but I, I am a big reliever in I'm going to run my business the way I run my life. And that means authenticity and connection and transparency. Like I've got to be very honest with our clients so that I can help them succeed. I love it. I resonate it. It's totally in line with, you know, the missions and values of, of, of Richard Listens and what I'm trying to teach men to work on, whether it be through men's groups or through my work with athletes and private clients. The question I have for you is most of my clients are coming in talking about every new app under the sun, right? Particularly for women. And it sounds, I mean, a part of me is trying to listen authentically to my clients. A part of me is jumping out of my skin. How do you live in this world? People seem to be getting addicted to the messages that don't even land in communication. How do we navigate this world and creating some sense of safety and, and progress within, you know, uh, you know the, and, and where people don't always have the best intentions or the same intention you have? Well, when you go on a dating app, no one has been screened, right? And a lot of people go on dating apps because they're in heartbreak or they're lonely or they're a kid or somebody says, you know, go on a date, go on a dating app, see what you can do. But there's no self-responsibility of, wait a minute, if I put myself on this app, I could crush somebody because I'm not ready, right? I could really impact someone's life in a negative way. Most people don't do that. It's a, there's an assumption that if you're on a dating app, you want a relationship. And everybody needs to forget that first and foremost. Um, some people are on it to pass time. It becomes gamified. So they're not built to get you into a relationship. They're built to keep you in the app. So there is a reward if you swipe left. There's a reward if you swipe right. And people are getting addicted to the attention. And then if you're not succeeding on a, a dating app, you could think that dating in general is terrible. But it's not dating that's terrible, it's this vehicle. It's this one application that is hindering you or preventing you. So there's a false illusion that you're gonna have more deal flow, but it ends up being a lot less because if you're going to spend, what, seven to 10 hours utilizing a dating app during a week, you gotta consider how much money do I make? What is my hour worth to me? And then what is the ROI on all of that swiping? Because you might swipe on four or 500 people in any given month, and you might end up having maybe 10, 15 chats that don't go anywhere and maybe one phone call. That's not a great ROI. But to me, a dating app, when someone says, yes, I've swiped right on you, that's tantamount to the old days before we had the apps where I walked into a restaurant, you were sitting there, you looked up and I looked up, and then we went on to our different tables. That's all that it is. It's a look up. And I think if people realize that they won't, they won't attach themselves to why didn't this person get back to me? Or why did they ghost? They didn't really ghost. It's just there's limited focus on these things because there's always somebody behind you. So it's just a, it's just a vehicle. It's just the car that got you to the connection. It's not the connection itself. But a lot of people don't know how to be, because it's a public space, they don't know how to be vulnerable in their profile. 
um, they talk more about what they do instead of who they are. And when we don't talk about who we are and we don't know how to connect and ask the right questions and have the right reason for the connections, these things are very easy to dismiss and walk away from. And it, it looks like ghosting. And then it feels like you've been rejected. When in reality, you haven't been rejected. The person has no idea who you are. So I think people are using it as a, as a meal instead of a side dish, right? It's just the side dish. I would recommend that people only spend maybe an hour a week on it. Like really sit down and just take like maybe 30 minutes on a Wednesday or 30 minutes on a Sunday, dive in and see who's there, make some nice connections because you can't get hurt by expressing yourself. Like there's zero chance of, of, of harm there. Um, and just take it in stride because it doesn't represent the entire dating world. It's just one way people date. And contrary to popular belief, not every single person is on a dating app. But now with COVID and the lockdown, uh, dating app usage is up, but the amount of people that are connecting is down because of the trust you mentioned. And mm -hmm. people don't know how to emote. They don't know how to write a great text. They don't know how to get on a Zoom or a FaceTime or even on a phone call and make it impactful and meaningful without completely weighing it down. So can you be light and airy and add value to somebody's day and have a meaningful conversation? Yes, of course. But if you're not trained how to do that, it's easy just to kind of go, you know what, to what end? Why would I be connecting with anybody right now? But there is data and there is proof that people are connecting right now and actually creating profound relationships because they can't meet, because they're connecting in this way and, and without that physical default of, you know, let's kiss, let's hop in the sack, people are actually creating better bonding, like better relationships and friendships that I think are going to survive once we come out of this. And even if restaurants open and theaters open, it doesn't mean that the, that the, that the unease and the lack of trust is going to go away. That's going to stay with us for a long time. So if I were a man, I'd be trying to create trust. A lot of the women are calling us every day to say, these men during lockdown, during this very scary time where we've got almost 100,000 people who have passed away from this virus are saying, let's meet tomorrow. <laughs> They're throwing caution to the wind. So it got me thinking, are men more in love with adventure and women more in love with security? And how do we marry those, right? Because women right now are, are more fearful of getting together than men are. And I find that really interesting. So how are we going to build trust from a dating app or anybody else before we meet so that that person can feel comfortable? And that means sharing your uh, logistics and, and who you've been in quarantine with and how careful you've been. And this is going to require patience. And a lot of very ambitious, driven people haven't practiced patience because they're so used to, if I add, you know, X, Y, Z, and I motivate and I use my muscle and I use my strength and my intellect, I'm going to just get it done. And right now it's a time to go, okay, how can I use my intuition? How can I, you know, level up my listening skills, not my speaking skills, but my listening skills so that I can make this person feel safe. This is a perfect example, actually, uh, April, because, right, there's, there's a level up in the challenge, right? We could say, when I'm hearing you say this, is it a male, is it a Mars Venus thing? Is it a male female thing? You know, mm -hmm. is this somehow a biological driven thing where men are like well we have to keep the species going uh you know even if we're living in you know a quarantine and women are like no no we gotta make sure we're safe first so it could be all those things but the beauty of what you just said i've had clients who are in relationships and yet you know if you were in the same relationship and you were not seeing your partner for a week or two because you were working all the time well that might be perceived a certain way and if you were doing it because you were gambling or out with the guys that might be perceived another way <laughs> you know and if it's a quarantine still it can be perceived as are you invested are you being vulnerable are you being close so little things like even if we cannot see each other how do we make a how do we respond to one another are we sensitive to things that are coming up because we cannot see each other and we cannot meet those needs so how do we step into this space which could be totally uncomfortable it's not necessarily about like one side has to win because we all know from anyone who's going to a beach or on a hike or just going around your neighborhood or to the grocery store you know uh you know 
April got to witness, you know, on camera, right? Somebody coming in your house or an old friend, you want to give them a hug. And you're like, oh, wait, I can't. So, you know, I, I just read this morning, can't even give high fives maybe for sporting events for the future. So, <laughs> you know, how do we find this, this new way of creating chemistry and staying vulnerable, um, you know, through all of this? Yeah, people are, we, I, I've been calling it the two week cliff. So when uh, people are meeting, about seven to 14 days in, even if there's an original excitement, mm -hmm. there's a cliff, there's a, like a, a point where everybody just says, you know what, we could otherwise be connecting in a normal environment, but since we're in the middle of this COVID experience, let's just stop talking. And that, that is um, something that's really upsetting me because these are valuable, to me, every connection is valuable. Um, the hard part is that if you're used to creating chemistry in person, right, that physical sexual chemistry, no, the, how do we translate that, right? If you can't hug and you can't kiss, like what are you supposed to do, right? Um, and so people who have been saying like, let's just pause on this for now, I've said, no way, this is, the, this is your best opportunity. You have more of an opportunity right now to create connection than ever before. But I think people don't want to make the investment unless they know there's going to be physical chemistry. And I think it's a, I think it's the wrong way to date. If I were single right now, I would be loving connections. I might be talking to somebody and maybe I've seen them on Zoom or FaceTime and there's, and I, there's no chance there could be physical chemistry, but there's an intellectual chemistry. So is that viable to me? Sure. I'll keep talking to that person. Then I'm talking to somebody who's hitting my funny bone and he's just really funny. Maybe he's too young or too old, but I'm laughing. And so there's, ad, there's value add. So I'm gonna keep talking to that person. Or there's somebody that I have an emotional connection with or a spiritual connection with. To me, it wouldn't matter what is the end goal, what is the end result, it's the experience. So if we fell in love with, let me just experience these conversations, as long as there's value add, I'll keep them going. And that's, that's the hard part for a lot of people to learn because they don't want to invest unless they know that there's a outcome. Right. Right. And they start, they start going right, particularly on a clock. And, and if I don't get in a relationship now, then, you know, we start going on five-year plans where right. in, where when we, when we look back and one of the gifts of this quarantine, you mentioned, uh, you know, I'm having zoom calls with people that I knew when I was, you know, friends when we were 12 and 13 and 14, um, you know, and the beauty of reflecting on some of those environments, uh, even as I'm putting it in um, the Richard Listen's book that'll be coming out this year is some of the gift of like summer camp these relationships where you were in an experience together and the relationship flowed because you you were there just being yourself with them you know the, you know there were no pretense you were just enjoying doing a lot of times healthy things right outdoors activities so i mean how much of this is encouraging people to just get into a process together and how do you do that when you're in a, a quarantine can you, how do you establish some of those common activities where connections form? I th well, I think first and foremost is being honest. You know, if you're talking to somebody, you know, we've never before had an, had an opportunity in the single community or otherwise to have a shared experience. So usually when people get on the phone with each other pre-pandemic, it was, I got to find out what their life is like. Well, you already have a direct line of connection. I already know what your life is like, right? You're not getting out and doing the things you normally do. So if we started with our humanity of first and foremost, how are you? You know, how are you doing? How are your kids? How are you dealing with your kids? How are you dealing with the fact that you just had to lay off 150 employees? You know, just really asking those feeling questions. And we could, when we're talking about the activities we were doing, instead of doing those tennis matches together or going to see theater together or going and enjoying a beautiful restaurant or meal together, we could be talking about those experiences instead of saying, what restaurant do you like? Oh, I usually go to Capo. How about saying, what is your favorite meal? Like, what, what did you love about that place? What do you miss about sailing? What do you miss about going to the theater? What do you miss about, you know, playing tennis with your partner? Well, my partner, you know, we've known each other for 20 years. And so when you hear someone's story, you're no longer talking about tennis or the theater. You're, now you're talking about something really deep and rich. I call it drilling for oil. Or, you know, who taught you how to sail? My dad. Oh, is your dad still alive? No, sadly he passed. Oh, tell me what he was like. You know, it's just a, it's a, instead of going in a linear way of a very neck up conversation, why not like dive deep 
And then what's happening is we're seeing each other's lifestyle and activities even on the phone. We actually don't even have to get on a FaceTime. You could do this closing your eyes and you could still hear someone's voice and, and feel that excitement and connection. And you're going on those journey, those journeys with that person. But it's, it's, Cause that's, it's chem that's chemistry too, right? Chemistry yeah. was in high school when you call someone on the phone, a girl or guy, mm -hmm. and you feel like, oh my God, there's such a connection here. Like well, when we were younger, right? We were going to school with, pe with people. So we had, when people say dating was easier when I was younger, well, yeah, of course, because we were together more, you know, as we get older, we've got our separate jobs and our separate lives and our separate activities and schedules. And so the commonality starts to dissipate, but trying to think of like, what activities do we have in common is the wrong way to go. Activities don't make a great relationship. Sim similar values do, similar goals, right? Um, the ability to connect. So yeah, if we're gonna have to try to find those things again. And a lot of people are doing, hey, let's watch Netflix together on Zoom. Let's make <laughs> dinner on FaceTime. People are doing that, but it, it doesn't work. It's not sustainable because they think that it's the activity itself that that's what they should put on FaceTime or Zoom right now. And I say otherwise, it's kind of fun to throw it in, mm -hmm. but it's, it can also be very forced. And what people are doing is let's get on a FaceTime or a Zoom or a phone call. Let's spend two hours qualifying one another and making sure that we're building a relationship. You don't have to build relationship as much as, much as you should be building connection and rapport and just allowing it to kind of have its air and some pacing to it because people are exhausted. I'm not watching Netflix all day. I, I know a lot of people are bored. I've had the busiest month of my entire career. Um, <clears throat> yes, please share about your projects and what level Connections yeah, is doing sure. but before I, you get another text from abroad. <laughs> <laughs> but I, um, you know, I, I feel like that, uh, now I've lost my, my track, but uh, you have to assume that just because you're connecting with somebody, another single person, it doesn't mean that they're not busy still, or they're not stressed, or maybe they've been on Zoom meetings all day with work because everybody's now away from the office. So we're using tech more, and this format that you and I are doing, we're used to it, but there's a lot of people that aren't. And so, as you would know, Richard, it's exhausting, right? It's mentally exhausting. It's exhausting, Zoom fatigue is a thing, like, you know, directing towards children's mental health and the long-term applications. I mean, there's so many things. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, but it does tie into, right, I mean, I, I know we're short on time, but, you know, the high performers in general, where, you know, people are giving so much energy, how is their space left, right? You're trying to help people who are really successful and, and now are missing this key component, which, you know, we thought used to be the first thing, right? I had this idea that you're supposed to be together with someone in a white picket fence, then your life takes off. Now, you know, men, women in the workplace, you know, is shared roles it's confusing for people how do you make a connection from this place and with our devices how do we still through all of our like demand right even zoom right now how much attention we can't look off you know and, and look somewhere else without you know not that not that i want to look away from this amazing conversation but in general when you're in meetings all day long people are having like anxiety about a three-hour zoom meeting so <laughs> how do you stay connected how do you be present you know I think it's also just being honest. You know, it's telling somebody, I'd love to get on a Zoom with you, but I've been on five already today. Um, can we can we make that for Sunday at two? You know, just, especially a lot of women, they're afraid to say no, because if we go into scarcity mode, gosh, if I say no to this person, um, or if I don't jump on the bandwagon quickly and make it happen, he or she is gonna be gone. And that's just scarcity. You know, if you're coming from abundance and faith, you'd say, you know what, I'm just so depleted right now and I won't be my best. Can we, can we push this out a week? Can we do this on Sunday? Can we do this on Saturday? Really just practicing that self-care and being honest and transparent. I think that's first, right? And also if you're on something and it's awkward, instead of trying to fake that it's not awkward, <laughs> calling it out and just going, this is so weird. Like, I don't feel like myself. I'm not on my game. I hope you're not judging me. You know, my house is a mess or the kids are running by. Whatever is going on, call it out, you know? <laughs> or Zoom makes me shy, you know, I'm not used to this. That's so endearing. And when you can do that, you enable somebody to take care of you. And that's hard for high achievers. It's so hard to look like they don't have it all packaged up and ready to go. And I think that's kind of a nice combo because it brings you kind of more down to earth and more accessible, right? 
So it's just about the honesty and verbal transparency, in my opinion. And you get to see if somebody, right, can, can you allow yourself to be cared for? Can you allow someone to step into that space when you're vulnerable? And that's part of the feedback afterwards. I mean, the greatest gift I've had, uh, and before we let you share all your amazing work with Level Up and ways people can reach you, the, the gift for me for the Richard Listen Show was, you know, with all the PhDs and all the letters and all the certifications that some part of me tells me I need to keep acquiring to be good enough or to be the expert right that the show became a way when i'd come out my my dear friend peter Sobe, uh who co-hosted with me and he'd say how come you only spoke for five minutes today how come you were shy how come you, you were so serious today so you know that value of having and you can practice this even if you're not in a committed relationship with your friendship inviting in feedback inviting in coaching you know ways in which you can improve or be more of yourself and having that I feel that trust going on. So everybody, you know, I have people come up to me, hey, I haven't recorded in a while because they know this space is something I've created from authenticity. So, you know, inviting people to help you do that and inviting April into your life to help you, you know, get to your next level and get to your soulmate. What are you waiting for? I mean, who's, who's more worth it, right? I mean, well, the power of who you can become when you are receiving the love you need well, is you, exponentially greater. 100%. And, you know, you and I spoke before and I instantly felt a, a rapport with you and I think you're so amazing and wonderful. And, you know, it's not because you're a PhD. I mean, that's awesome. But, you know, the, the man I responded to, right? So I think if, you know, now that so many people are out of work or they've had to shut their businesses down or they've had to lay off a lot of people. So rough. The, the mm -hmm. nice thing, it's rough, but the nice thing about this time right now is that we're realizing, wait a minute, if I don't have my fancy car and I don't have my big office and I don't have my big company and I don't have my big job and I'm not able to do my career in the way I do it, what's left? And so I think what we're going to find is from the high achieving standpoint, it's who are we? If all of that is stripped away, did I build my confidence on what I've, what I've earned or gained or amassed in my life? Or have I, or have I learned my core confidence by who I am? Because who you are is what's going to be super attractive to your partner, whether you're dating or you've been dating your wife for 20 years, it doesn't matter, right? It's, it's th those elements are what's left. And I think along with the humbling and sort of the loss that we're experiencing is also the emerging of, wait a minute, I still have my core traits that make me amazing in a relationship, right? And that's what's left and that's all we need. And I think that's a beautiful, beautiful thing that's gonna happen from this. Yeah. I mean, you get to know yourself. Who are you when you can't engage your masks? Even when those masks are what society sees you as your strong yeah. alpha identity, you know, when you're home and you're vulnerable and you're fumbling, uh, you know, <laughs> with <laughs> being a handyman or, you know, trying to paint a door yeah. or, uh, or, or use, do something you've never done before. Uh, that's the moment that the growth is happening. And that's what's happening if you're allowing yourself to, to go on dates and be vulnerable and be a little bit different than you would be uh, and how you normally are in your regular life. So April, I'm so grateful for your time and sharing, uh, you know, your gifts with us. Uh, you know, Dr. Phil calls you the best of the best. So how can I top that? Um, please tell everybody, how can they find your, your course? If they're, they heard something, if they're single, if this has piqued their interest and how can they get uh, in contact with you more through social media and other media? Yeah, I'm actually in the middle of a course right now called Love on Your Level. The doors have already closed. Um, I'm teaching a, uh, it's a group of women um, called Love on Your Level, and it's really a preparation course, like the five tools to get ready for love. Uh, but you can still uh, find in more information from me on aprilbuyer.com, and Level is levelconnections.com. Uh, we are accepting actual applications from, uh, from women right now and men, um, so that's where you find us. Incredible. Amazing. What a better time. Every time historically we've gone through major uh, challenges like this, uh, people have responded through coming together, focusing on what's important. And uh, it is certainly, you know, my hope that people are focusing on being more authentic version of themselves and c connecting and stepping out of their comfort zone and into a more meaningful relationship. Uh, I'm thankful for you, April. We hope to be a resource to you and your clients uh in getting them together keeping them together <laughs> working through the bumps and bruises i'll send them to you richard <laughs> <laughs> well 
we'll have them off camera <laughs> in between podcasts. And it's been the gift of this whole thing. I'm giving up my office. So I'll be pulling green screens, going straight from sessions into podcasts. So that's been the gift of the quarantine to me. Uh, look forward to hearing from all of you, your quarantine gifts, shifts you're making through Instagram and uh, patreon.com slash Richard Listens. Again, uh, April Beyer, um, Level Connections. If you're not in there, it, do something different. Do one thing different today in the way you're relating to uh, the opposite sex and trying to get connected, whether you be uh, 18 or 65 and still trying to find love. Um, connections make life more enjoyable no matter what experience you're in whether you be unemployed recovering uh or be a multi-million dollar ceo of a sports franchise uh it's never too late and now is always the best moment thank you april thank you so much beautifully said well that was just illuminating thank you again April Beyer, again, Level Connections. Check her out on Instagram and Facebook if you haven't done so already. I thank you all for tuning in um, and always being supporters of the show. If you are interested, check out Injitsu or Impact Dental Designs. I've done a workout. It's kicked my butt. I'll tell you it's well worth it. And you can get to know some of MMA fighters who are going back in the ring and get to ask them Q&A about how they keep in shape and prepare for their next performance moment at the end. Thank you again. I'm Richard Listens. You've been great. And I'm out.